Hello everyone, this is Rob Pike, back again with the final episode in the series, Buried with Christ, Raised to Walk in the Newness of Life. This series has been created to show you the nature and the power of the resurrection, which the Apostle Paul discussed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yes, it absolutely has the power to change your life for good now. In the last video, we looked at the first 41 verses of the chapter. Now in this video, we will look at the remaining verses. But before we continue with the remaining verses, let's take one more look at the seed analogy given by the Apostle Paul. So if you're ready, let's begin. <music> Now, as I stated last time, what I want you to remember in this passage is that if the resurrection of those who have died physically was a bodily resurrection of the same type that goes into the ground, there would have been no purpose for Paul to give the seed analogy. The body that dies and goes into the ground is like a seed. Therefore, the body that comes up out of the ground is a different body, suited for the purpose which is chosen by God. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39 through 41, that we will, re we will review again. <clears throat> for not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for the stars differ from star in glory. Continuing with this seed analogy, Paul gives some examples of different types of bodies. Each one is individually suited for its own purpose. Additionally, even with the heavenly bodies, each type has its own glory. For example, the sun has a magnitude of glory that is far greater than the moon. So as we continue with verse 42 through 44, we see, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Revelation, the 20th chapter, and verse 4 through 5, tells us that there are two groups who participate in the first resurrection. Notice what it says. It says, Then I saw thrones, and, I, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life in the, until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Now, in order to put this in perspective, we must remember the prophecy of Daniel, the 12th chapter, verse 1 through 7, which tells us when this resurrection would occur. Let's read this again. It says, At that time shall Michael arise, the great prince who has charge of your people and there shall be a time of trouble such as has never been there was a nation till that time but at that time your people shall be delivered everyone whose name shall be found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt yes this is the resurrection then as we look at the conclusion of this passage, we see the timing of the occurrence. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and swore by him who lives forever, that it would be for time, times, and a half a time, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. Did you notice here how specific this verse was? It specifically says, when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. This had to be the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. This was the complete end of the old covenant and the Jewish Levitical system of worship. The power of God's heretofore holy people had been completely shattered. This system of worship was no longer possible. 
It also had to be the end of the millennium because Revelation 20 verse 5 plainly states that those dead in Christ did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Also, we must realize that Revelation 20 verse 4 tells us that the resurrection includes not only the saints who were beheaded, but also those who had not worshipped the beast or received the mark. Therefore, these are people who are still alive at that time. If the resurrection included both those dead at that time and those alive, we know that it meant all believers were resurrected, and that at that time both those who were physically dead and those who were physically alive were resurrected. Thus, the first resurrection is by nature a spiritual resurrection, but at A.D. 70 it did include those who were removed from paradise in Hades and were taken to heaven. This was the resurrection that Paul was speaking of in the passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44. Thus, we as believers are a part of the first resurrection. The picture Paul painted in Romans 6, 4 applies to us. We were buried with Christ. This put away our sin. Then we were resurrected to walk in the newness of life. We are already a part of the first resurrection. What a blessing. Revelation 20, verse 6 tells us that the second death has no authority over us. And this is in harmony with what Paul said. Now I want you to notice closely what the Apostle Paul said when he was speaking in the past tense. This is in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 4 through 8. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together but with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Do you see the powerful significance of what Paul said? Those saints who were still alive on earth were also seated with him in the heavenly places. It had already happened. Their resurrection from spiritual death was complete and the second death had no power over them. As we continue with verse 45 through 49 of 1 Corinthians, it says, Thus it is written, The first man Adam became a living being, the last man Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those of dust. And as we... And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born in the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Yes, this reiterates what happened in the Garden of Eden. When Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden, he was in perfect fellowship with God. His most important assignment was to obey God. When he did disobey God, he died that day spiritually. He was then separated from God. No more walks in the garden. No more discussions together. It was over. But physically, he lived for over 900 years. When Jesus died on the cross, he died physically as well, just as, as man did. But he also saw, suffered separation from God. Paul would later tell the Corinthian church, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him he might become the righteousness of God. As the Apostle John also noted, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The fact of the matter is that if Jesus came to this earth to suffer physical death so that we did not have to die physically, then this death, death was a failure. It was ineffective. Why? Because men have continued to die to this day without ceasing. But Jesus experienced the same alienation from God as man did when he died on that cross. As Paul said, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The only way for man to be restored to that right relationship with God was for him to also die in the flesh. 
This was done by belief in Christ as Lord and Savior. It is pictured perfectly by the baptism analogy, which we have talked about all along, which says, buried with Christ, raised to walk in the newness of life. Romans 6, 3 and 4. That new life is a spiritual one. When we accept Christ as Savior, we begin a new spiritual life with Christ, and we will never die again, spiritually that is. That is what Jesus meant when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? As we continue then with 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, we read, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Yes, the words used by the Apostle Paul in verse 50 make it clear that the kingdom of God is not primarily a physical kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom, which also includes physical components. We inherit this kingdom spiritually when we become believers. Thus, when our physical body dies, we do not actually die, but are changed in the twinkling of an eye. Isn't that awesome to know? Our spirit still lives, and we will receive a spiritual body, as we read earlier in verse 44. It is sown a natural body, it is raised up a spiritual body. Since Paul included himself in those who would not sleep, we know that Paul was expecting the return of the Lord at any time. What Paul was emphasizing in verse 51 through 53 was that soon at the parousia, the last trumpet, this would be finalized. The last trumpet occurred when the old law covenant came to an end, and that occurred at the complete destruction of Jerusalem, and the law covenant was put out of the way entirely. Not everyone would die at that time, but even those alive would be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an, of an eye, to complete spiritual life. Thus, they would never die. This is in harmony with, with what the writer of Hebrews said, so Christ, having been once offered to bear the sins of many, will also appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly await him. Do you see the pr profound significance of this statement? This event where Christ appeared a second time was also called the parousia, as stated above. It finalized the salvation for the believer. Did you notice the wording at the end of the verse? Those early Christians were eagerly awaiting this event, and Jesus was not about to disappoint them. It absolutely could not have been something that was to occur thousands of years later. When Jesus appeared the second time, the death of Adam, that is the spiritual death, was swallowed up forever. It is as Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who, who sent me has eternal life. He does not come unto judgment, but has passed from death to life. Yes, it is in the past tense that he said that. They have already passed from death to life. As we conclude the passage in 1 Corinthians 15, we read, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing it, that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It is no wonder that Paul breaks out in praise here. By the accomplishment of finally being changed to complete spiritual life, those alive at that time would never die, and those believers who had died physically would be raised from the paradise site of Hades to life in heaven and would receive their spiritual body. 
but it is true of both of those groups that they would always be with the Lord. What a great chapter of encouragement to those to whom Paul wrote. Now, as we are about to conclude this series, I would like to address a question which has often been posed concerning this resurrection to spiritual life. It has to do with what occurred after Jesus' crucifixion. Let's read this passage. It says, The tombs were open, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is from Matthew 27, verse 52 through 53. Yes, this was a one-time event, and according to the words of the passage, many arose. Most likely, they were made visible as a sign to the Jews. The problem that we encounter with this passage is that it does not say anything else about this anywhere in Scripture. Therefore, the only thing that we have left is speculation. We do know that upon Jesus' death on the cross, and during the time between this and his resurrection, he was made alive in the Spirit, and he preached to the spirits in Hades, which was that two-compartment afterlife prison that we described and noticed in First. Peter, the third chapter, verse 18 and 19. So it seems likely that these ones who were raised were made visible to the Jews just after the death of Jesus at the crucifixion and may be included in the group that is spoken of in Ephesians 4, 8, which says, Therefore, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts for men. Thus we see from the seed analogy which we have discussed in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 43 through 44, when they rose from the dead, they were like, very likely raised to their life in their spiritual body, as was Jesus, and therefore followed Jesus directly to heaven. With this video, we have reached the conclusion of the series. I certainly hope that you have enjoyed this series and have learned something from it. So I would ask that if you did like this, subscribe to this channel so that when I put out videos, you can get them as a, the content is released. Also, if you'd like a copy, a documented copy of this material, I have put it in the appendix of two of my books, The Lamb of God Victorious and God's Purpose for Hell, both of which are available from Amazon.com in both the paperback format and the Kindle formats. So until the next time, I would like to say thank you for watching this series, and God bless.